Futura posted us for Big Science Africa last year. Uh, so uh, that was that was fascinating seeing uh, them come out with very very natural habitats and uh, yeah. interesting to see what uh, what stuff comes out of uh, being in such a being in such an environment. Um, so uh, a few words of introduction uh, for Neil. Um, Neil is a, a, a very approachable and a down to earth guy. So you, you, while interacting with him, you might not realise uh, what a major figure of machine learning uh, he is. Uh, uh, not only that, but he's uh, really been, had this long term engagement with us now in, in Uganda. I mean, just this whole process, like, and then I've even lost count of how many times he's been here over, over the years. Uh, and uh, you know, invited people over to over to Sheffield, been extremely supportive. So it, it's really not every day we have a, a top machine learning professor. Uh, you even visit us, never mind have a, a sort of multi-year, you know, PhD sharing, conference organizing, you know, kind of multi-dimensional engagement. So, uh, you know, we're all enormously appreciative and uh, it's just a great opportunity to have you. That's very kind. I, I kind of, uh, well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to do it without all the stuff uh, you're all doing here, but particularly John. Um, so thanks uh, again for the invite to give a talk. So, um, uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about data science challenges or new directions in data science, I think is the, uh, although that's making me think I, I updated that title, so let me just make sure I've got the most up-to-date version of the talk. Uh, new directions in data science, there we go. Um, uh, which is, is something that I'm sort of quite interested in. I'm actually becoming more interested in as, uh, as I get less capable of carrying, uh, keeping up with all the technological developments in the sort of social phenomena of data science and what it means. Because it's gonna have big effects, I think, in the same way that computers had big effects on us, and you know, indeed it's brought about by computers. So this is a sort of an attempt to have some thoughts about that and to share some of those ideas with you, see what you think. So the sort of background is that you know, data is a very pervasive phenomenon and it affects all of us now, all aspects of our activities. You know, and I think that, that, that the effect in uh, countries like Uganda is perhaps even more dramatic than it is in countries like UK because it's such a, you know, you're getting state of the art stuff now through uh, Facebook and mobile phones and everything else like that. So there's this, the gap between infrastructure and um, uh, in Africa and the UK is closing very, very quickly. Um, but it also, I, I have this sense that it's, it's pervasive and it, what I call diffusive. It, it's, it's so diffusive, it's everywhere that it's difficult for people to think about or embody. So, so it's difficult for people to sort of represent and talk about its value. Um, and this prevents sort of challenges, um, it presents opportunities because it gets everywhere. And we've heard about that in the workshop so far, all the things that you can do by exploiting this data availability. So. Um, Here's my little diagram. It's not, not super clear, I'm afraid, is it? But um, of what I think is really going on, why there's a challenge in data science. So what I've got, it's a sort of trinity. I've got human at the top of the trinity. And data's kind of already exi always existed. Um, and so this relationship between human and data. Now the width of the line I've put is to try and indicate that that's quite a low bandwidth communication. So the amount of data we can absorb is, is relatively small. So we're actually very good at trying to draw. We jump to conclusions, but we're also good at drawing conclusions and assimilating the fairly limited data we can consume. But then what we added was this new relationship with the computer. And we can only absorb things from the computer at the same rate we can absorb from the environment. We don't suddenly gain special powers on the computer. But the really interesting thing is this massive bandwidth connection between data and the computer. So we're, we're building computers, mobile phones, can assimilate and store much, much more, more data. And this means that we've got this sort of new connection between the human and the computer that is sort of dominating over the human to data communication. So that's got real big advantages, but also potential downsides. Because what I see it as is this is the sort of new information flow. So the information flow throughout history, prehistory, in Kenya, where Shear is from, where we evolved, you know. Uh, <laughs> um, there was always this relationship between human and the data they see around themselves. Maybe they're not writing it down, they're not storing it. It's not data in numbers, but we're assimilating data. But now we have this weird thing. I mean, how many people spend all their time like this, you know, looking at their phones? So they're not actually looking at their environment anymore. And that's going to get even more extreme with virtual reality and these sort of ideas. So this is what data science is about, I think. And there's dangers here because this 
relationship is now in the control of data scientists, computer scientists, companies, Facebook, whoever. So there's an enormous amount, uh, possibility to distort. Of course, there's a possibility to distort here as well. But this flow of information can distort things. And I think that that's the origin of a lot of the challenges in data science. We want to make this good. We want to understand what's going on in the country, where we have to deliver drugs, where that we should change agricultural practices. And we want to use that flow to do that. But it's, it's such a powerful thing that it can also have dangers. So what are the societal uh, effects? Well, we're starting to get situations where you've got automated decision making with, from the computer based only on the data without sort of human intervention. Um, and so we have to uh, build a better requirement to understand also our own subjective biases to ensure that the human to computer interface formulates the correct conclusions from the data as well. So it's very easy to fool humans and make people do things they don't want to do, like marketing and all these sort of tricks. This is how most people seem to make money. So if you've got a lot of power over this control here, you've also got a lot of power to manipulate the humans based on data. Because part of this data is, of course, about the humans themselves. So this is a sort of uh, dangerous effect. So now this. For me, I, I did a lot of work in computational biology early in my career, sort of uh, from 2001, and the changes it had on the field of biology, where biologists previously were looking at small amounts of data, they could only measure small amounts, but then they could suddenly measure transcriptome, the sort of uh, RNA in your cells, they can measure genome, this wealth of data that was way too much for an individual. And then there was a community of computationalists who um, come in and help things out, and there's this big shift in dynamic from the direct pathway between the human and the data to an indirect pathway between human and data via the computer. Now, what, um, what um, in, in classical biology, the pathway between the human and the data is classical statistics. So there are biases humans have, and we've worked out ways of removing those biases by using classical statistics to make sure that we don't distort those biases when we're doing science. So that's something that we've evolved, and it's kind of quite rigorous. But now in data science, we've got this massive ability to manipulate the data, and we have to revisit some of those things. Um, so this, this is the change in dynamics that's giving this modern and emerging field of data science. I mean, the other aspects of it is when you do this human-to-data interaction in classical statistics, you control very rigorously how you collect the data. Randomized control trials, surveys that are randomized. That's how you can do it. Here, we're no longer doing that. So the control is going to be through the computer. OK, so I've identified sort of three challenges that I want to focus on. I just like to do things in threes. People like threes. Maybe there's more challenges, but threes are sort of easier thing to remember. So I've sort of broadly, there's probably other things that I'm missing. But I've categorized them in this first thing that I think of as paradoxes of the data society. Things you think you might expect to happen if you're in a data-rich society, but they don't. They go in the opposite direction. Or seemingly at the moment, we're in this really dynamic world at the moment, so things are changing very rapidly. This issue of quantifying the value of data. So much data is being moved around now that it's like a separate economy. And then finally, the issues of privacy, loss of control through uh, giving away part of yourself by giving away your data, and marginalization in society by being removed from that data economy. Because the one thing we want to do, data is disruptive, right? Now, what we want out of data disruption is we want a better world. We want it so that some of the inequalities we have today are gone. But there is a serious potential to make a worse world, to make a world where there are more inequalities. Why? Because power accumulates with data, just like it accumulates with money. So capitalism is about the fact that if I get a lot of money together, I can have a much more significant effect than individuals with small money. Microfinance is about trying to counteract that effect. Data has the same sort of thing. If I get a lot of data together, I have a lot of power. If you have a little bit of data on your own, you can't do anything. And it may have that effect in an even greater way. So there's clearly potential to bring about inequality. So this first paradox, what I call, what I think of as the measurement paradox. So we're in this odd situation where we now have an ability to measure to a greater and greater, more accurate degree, the actions of individuals. But it seems, certainly in the UK, for example, we're becoming less able to characterize society. So if we want to sort of represent what society's thinking, um, 
we seem to understand less about it. So I've got this weird sort of feeling that as we measure more, we seem to understand less about the system. Now, does that make sense? So, what? <laughs> this is a paradox, and I'm not sure it's a true, necessarily always going to be a true thing. It's just something I feel is going on at the moment. Um, and, and why could it possibly happen? It's a wooden trees argument, right? If you're spending the time in the forest, in the conservancy in Kenya, looking very closely at some plants, right, in, in a great de detailed study, you're not learning about the larger ecosystem of the forest, which may be what's important. That plant's probably irrelevant. You could kill it and nothing would happen. The, the, what's relevant is the sort of complex interacting system. So you want to know what to measure. Uh, Shira talked about indicator species. So those indicator species, he wants to probably select those to represent what's going on in the whole ecosystem, not just what's going on for that species. So we've got that sort of problem here. If we're measuring all of us individually to a very high characterization, but how representative are you? Jamie yesterday said that 80% of uh, Ugandan women uh, can't read a full sentence. So that means that uh, only two of you can read any of these slides. <laughs> Absolutely not true, because, of course, in Kampala, that's absolute, that statistic is, only, is totally invalid. Um, and we were looking at it last night over dinner, actually, and it's, uh, John was saying there's a pastoral section in the north where almost no one can read. So, and, and actually, Jamie was making that point because she was saying that you should use these surveys because they're spoken surveys and you get information from this group. Now, that type of effect where we're starting to align more on social media, John's talk about the... Um, uh, about the radio, uh, using radio to pick up what's going on in local communities rather than social media. Because if you look at social media, you'll get a biased point of view. So these are sort of, in Shearer's terms, these are indicator species that are not representative of the ecosystem you're trying to study. And we're still learning how to um, pull out those indicator species. But having said that, you get these very strong conclusions because you can see all this data and it seems very persuasive, so you think something's going on which is not. So you actually get a very misleading impression and you make wrong decisions. So, um, so this, this uh, I call it, I started thinking of it as a curate's egg of a society. Um, so curate's egg is a very old Victorian cartoon uh, by a guy called George du Maurier of a curate eating an egg, which is bad. And then the bishop asks him, um, how's your egg? And he says, it's good in parts. So um, <laughs> obviously a bad egg is bad. So, so um, there's the curate's egg measurement effect that if you're measuring only parts, you've actually destroyed the whole. You can't have an egg that is bad only in parts or good in parts. So examples of the 2015 UK election where the election came out that it was very equal um, uh, across society and then actually the Conservative Party had a seven-point lead and obtained a majority. And because they thought it was very equal, one explanation why we recently had a referendum is because the, um, the leading party was so convinced they weren't going to maintain the balance of power, they could make promises that they weren't going to have to deliver on. So they made promises thinking, well, we're not going to have to deal with that because we'll be in coalition anyway. In fact, they're making those promises to ensure that they have some power in the coalition, but then they had to deliver on these things. So that's super important to have misjudged the electorate in that way. I mean, one, maybe your politicians shouldn't be doing that stuff, but, you know, hey, politicians are politicians everywhere. Um, clinical trials and personalized medicine. So as we get... Uh, and, and, and okay, so what went wrong here, sorry, I should say, is that they're trying to gather information from telephone polls and online polls and put it together to get a representative idea of the population. But the population is very dynamic, so the number of people who have home telephones now is reducing. And you don't quite know the number of what, so what characterizes that population or what characterizes the population that's answering online. So when they weight these polls and bring them together, they didn't get the right sort of information. Now, after the election, People have done studies where they did proper randomized trials of people going and knocking on people's doors and going into the house, and then you recover the result. You actually find out that it's true, the election result. It wasn't false, it's just the polls were wrong. They measured the wrong things. Um, and the society is becoming more diverse, so you get an incorrect prediction. In clinical trials and personalized medicine, so that's where you're, you're your, um, the system is complex and you're measuring only certain parts. In clinical trials and personalized medicine, this is the idea that if we introduce a new drug, rather than curing the whole population, we're going to try and cure a subset of the population. So, so many cancers have a range of different causes. So we might be able to cause, uh, cure one group of their cancer because it's got one cause but not another. But when you start doing that, if you've got a population of 1,000 people with, that, with cancer, 
It may only be that 50 people have that particular type of cancer. So the structure of the problem is more complex. So now, in order to do a trial on 50 people, you don't have the statistical power. So that's another way in which it's sort of manifesting that the system you're studying is more complex and you're trying to do a well-regulated statistical trial on part of the system. Uh, other examples, social media memes where things are capturing on social media. I mean, there's some terrible things gone in the UK in, in terms of politics and what people think. Like we had this period of people emigrating into Europe trying to cross the Mediterranean. And you've got these examples of, in fact, they just recovered a ship where I think 800 people died in a sunken ship because they sent a merchant ship to rescue it and they collided and the ship sunk. I don't think anyone even remembers that that happened. It was just the Italian Navy had just gone down to fish it out. And they banned the rescuing of people from the Mediterranean to try and stop people moving. This went on across a summer in the UK election where the leading parties were consistently being anti-immigration in order to gain power. And this was hardly even mentioned. Now, shortly after that, I think even, was it September or later, this poor boy, Alan Kurdi, uh, died while trying to cross from, I think, Turkey into Greece, was washed up, a uh, Syrian boy, uh, was washed up in the shore. And uh, where he lay on the shore, he looked like a sleeping boy, I think, in that image. And that image caused a massive change in the perception of people across the UK, in term, briefly, for like three weeks, um, for the immigration problem. Yet thousands of people were dying every month. And it's, it, it, it has this change because it's a social media meme. There was more outcry about shooting a lion in Zimbabwe than there was about you know, these people, thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean. And that, to me, is a massive distortion of what's going on in the world. But it comes about because you know, I like lions too. And, and actually, when everyone shares it, you get these social media meme effects where everyone thinks that that's a very important thing. And they, then probably that national park has a load of money protecting lions now. Um, lots of things like that. And then this, is, this, this falls into these things called filter bubbles and echo chambers that amongst you, you don't, um, when you're working on social media, now I'm getting most of my news through Facebook, for example. My news feed is tailored towards me. It's tailored towards the things I interact with and care about. So all I see is the things I already like, the things I always want to see. Like in the old days, if you got most of your news from television or a national newspaper, you're being forced to read things that are outside your beliefs and you're being forced to challenge yourself. So these effects always occur within our societies, within our countries, but the extent to which they can now occur because Facebook can feed us what we want to read, and so we can become more entrenched in our opinions. These are very uh, dangerous things. So, so th these are sort of actual government statistical effects where we fail to measure what's going on in society. These are personal effects where we as individuals don't understand people's points of view anymore because all we hear is our own views reinforced. And they're all coming about because of a change in structure through data. So what are the solutions? You know, the, the picture's not, I mean, this is actually should be a good thing in the, in the long term, but I think one of the paradoxical solutions is people sort of have this idea that data science is going to replace classical statistics, and I think that is absolute rubbish. Classical statistics in terms of genuine measurement of things becomes more important. This also happens in biology, like people sort of said, oh, well, well, because we've got so much data, we can model biological organisms, we don't have to do experiments on them anymore because we can predict the results. No, you have to do more experiments because the scientific process is this cycle of experiment and validation, and the only tool we have for genuinely validating what we're doing, what our predictions are, is classical statistics. So if we're going to if we're going to deploy a new may of measure, way of doing surveys across northern Uganda, and we want to know if that may, way is representative, actually, our only way of finding out is to actually go into the field and do something randomized. Now, that won't always be possible because of limited resource, but we need to work out ways of, of ensuring that we continue to do these things. Otherwise, what we'll do is we'll just focus on the sort of data vocal minority which we tend to hear about more, those who already have access to things that cause them to generate data. Um, and I think we need a much better characterization needs and flaw, of human needs and flaws in that system. So in that sort of mapping of information flow from the data to the human, we need that thing to be unbiased, to understand what sort of flaws humans have, to not be exploiting humans' flaws when presenting the data to humans, but be second-guessing what the misunderstandings will have. These are very, very complicated problems, I think, and I don't think people are sort of looking at them enough. So the next sort of challenge is what I sort of say is quantifying the value of data. 
So I had this sort of thought, I like analogies and metaphors. So uh, there's a sea of data, but it's undrinkable. <laughs> because you can't analyze it until you desalinate it. So most data is kind of useless because it wasn't really thought about how it was going to be used in the end. Someone has to carefully deal with that data and make it consumable. So that's what I was sort of saying, data desalinization here. Um, and uh, I mean, look at the work Bernard was talking about yesterday uh, with GeoGecko in terms of trying to take the satellite data and turn it into something that can be consumed. That's like a desalinization process. There's no awards for it. There's no medals. There's no Nobel Prize for sitting there clicking on uh, um, uh, houses. But it's so vital in making these sort of pieces of information useful. But we're not actually, so they'll have a business model for making money from that data. And, and probably because it's mapping of a major city in Kampala, that will work. But what about all those cases where there isn't a serious business model for doing that because the direct value of that data is not clear? The value is there in society, but it's not accounted for because people won't pay money directly for it. But it may enable a whole load of other things to happen. We've seen lots of data sets that are like that. Um, so how do you quantify that sort of value in the data economy? How do we encourage data workers, curation, management of data? This thing we were hearing from Evan and Ernest about incentivization of farmers to produce data such that that data can be returned into the system. The direct value of getting that data is not kind of there, it's indirect. But its indirect value is massive. Yet we don't have an economic system, our bartering system of drive me to the UNHCR, that'll be 20,000, 10,000, 15,000, okay, whatever, 20,000 then, fine. Um, that is a direct sort of, I get something because I gave you money. And, and, and data is so indirect. This pervasiveness, this diffusiveness, we won't even know what it will be used for in the future, the data sets you're collecting now. So <clears throat> how do we incentivize and how do we quantify the value of these people's contribution? This seems like a major thing. And you know, the good news is in many senses, as I was commenting, uh, I think after Ernest's talk, Africa's ahead here because um, there are already mobile money, mobile phones in the field to collect data. It's much actually simpler to start implementing systems that test incentivization processes here than it is in the, the sort of UK um, or uh, our neighbors in the EU or um, uh, the United <laughs> States. Um, so credit allocation is super important. This is actually a really big problem. So when we talk about a big challenge in AI, credit allocation is a massive challenge in AI. What decision that your AI made was the most important thing in creating the goal? Money is a credit allocation system for society, right? It's a way of allocating who did what to get to some societal goal. It's not really an end in itself, or for some people it is, but that's the incentive. Um, so Direct work on the data is creating this enormous amount of value, but it's unaccounted for in the economy. And it's not even measured, right? Because it's not, because it's so, because people do it for free or they just, you know, they share the work or something like that, then um, it, it, it's sort of almost like a separate economy running parallel to the, you know, they do it in exchange for favors. I'll share your data, you know, I'll do something on your, my data, you do something on yours. That's much more like pre money societies where you're sort of, uh, here's a cow, can I have three chicken, you know, this sort of uh, type thing. Um, so I, I don't quite know how to solve that. I think that's a really uh, big one. Uh, but um, how, how we start solving these things is something that I think we're going to talk a lot about later is, is what the solutions are is uh, to get data in a consumable form, to desalinate data, encourage greater interaction between application <coughs> domains and data scientists. Another area where, you know, this is the reason I'm here, kind of because Africa's ahead in this. It's more interesting in this. The data sets are more interesting. There's a much closer drive to uh, get the data science done. So I think it's a much more exciting environment to do this in. But this is something that I think is really important that uh, you've got people who are very domain aware. And we've heard about that. John, John's a great leader in this, uh, as is the Pulse Lab here, um, Ernest and everyone else. Another thing that comes to mind, and this is inspired by things that John's told me about how you, um, how you get people to realize the importance of this data, is embody the data through visualization. 
So if you are a data creator, and we've seen it in lot, many of the talks, we've seen people sort of saying, this is what the farmers are doing. We saw Bernard's talk in terms of the, uh, this is what's going on in Kampala, this is where the schools are, these are the things. What are those things? They're cueing you to think about what you might be able to do with that data, because he's got to make money out of it, so he knows how to do that. But we should all be doing that with our data sets. We should be doing that with our data sets in such a way that other people are going, oh my goodness, I could do this with that data. It embodies the data, the visualization. If we have this diffuse concept of, I have counts of white fly from uh, 300 farms distributed across Uganda, what shall I do next? Well, you can guess at what you might do, but it may well be the wrong thing. You have to have communication with the domain experts, the farmers, the Ministry of Agriculture, and once you visualize the data, you're like, oh my God, that seems to be showing this sort of pattern. It also helps to ensure that you're desalinating because it's a sort of primitive form of consumption. It's the first filter. If you visualize and you're trained to look at flaws in the visualization, that's an odd effect. Why is that coming through there? Someone had a plot, I can't remember which one it was. But it was a plot with some months where it was going along and at month 70 there was a discontinuity and it was over a large amount of data, it was a box plot, so I can't remember whose plot it was and then at month 180 there was another discontinuity it was a very large plot and immediately I was looking at thinking there's something wrong with that plot because scaled over that number of data it was, um, it was to do with the budders I think what it was it, yeah but scaled over that amount of data, you wouldn't expect a discontinuity from one day to another because it sort of indicated that there was a massive communal change in behavior with all these people uh, doing whatever they were doing in the data set. Um, and that's the sort of thing we should be queuing on. We should say, ah, oh, that's a problem. We've seen that in the visualization. Let's go in. And I suspect it would be something to do with a change of measurement practice that was occurring at these sort of uh, fixed intervals. The, the, the days were, you know, there was something going on. And, and we should be looking for those things and, and working out those things before we present the data. Because actually, um, if you push this data out of Africa to somewhere like, you know, the, the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene or whatever it's called, leading in uh, epidemiology. If you're just going to send it via the internet to them and you, you haven't cleaned it and dealt with these things that are local knowledge based, you're not going to get the right conclusions. You want those modeling things to be being done here on the ground, close to the people that collected the data, and you want those people who collected the data to visualize their data and already eliminated those things to get the data desalinized and get it uh, useful. Um, Adoption of data resonance levels. So this is a concept I invented and then searched the internet and found someone else had got there before me. Um, but I don't think they did it very well, actually. It was very specific to nanotechnology. So in the UK, there's this thing known as a technology readiness level, which is a TRL. And, and they're the sort of things I hate, actually. They're the sort of things you write about in project reports saying this technology is at TRL level four and uh, we're going to move it through to TRL level seven. And what it means is... Where is the technology? Is it lab tested? Is it in development? Is it ready for implementation? Is it ready for sale? So it's actually, it's the sort of thing I hate writing about, but it's really, really important because it's a currency in terms of where you are with your technology. So if you're speaking to an investor, if it's generally agreed you're at TRL 9, you're ready to sell, right? And if you're talking, you know, someone who doesn't understand your technology can understand the technology readiness level. So I wonder if we should have something similar in terms of data readiness levels. So these are loose descriptions of where the technology is or would be data is in terms of its availability, in terms of how well curated, how is it, has it been visualized? So that if you're having discussions about projects you want to launch at, then people would sort of say, well, our data readiness level is, is, is six here, so we can go straight into the analysis or something like that. And then later on, you sort of say, oh, well, you said your data readiness level was six, but six implies that you visualized spatially and dealt with missing data problems or whatever it says. We haven't written these things, right? Um, and then, you know, th you know whose fault it is that this project isn't working out. And kind of blame is it's the same as credit. It's the negative of credit, right? So, um, you know, that's kind of important in understanding these pipelines and going forward. So I think things like that could be very useful. Um, and they have a lot of implications for these incentivization schemes in terms of um, pushing it through, not just at the level that Ernest and Evan were worrying about to the farmer, but pushing it through to the analysis as well. You're incentivized to do the analysis, to process data that is going to be potentially made openly available. At the moment, where's the incentive for that? That's like the most valuable thing you can do, is desalinate an open source data set, the sort of thing we were seeing with GeoGecko. Desalinating that open data set is one of the most valuable things you can do, but where's the value? 
It's not there, and it's very difficult to recover. You have to do it as a sort of charity thing because you're a nice person. Um, and finally, privacy, loss of control, and marginalization. So society is becoming harder to monitor, but you individually are becoming extremely easy to monitor. So we can't tell what society is doing, but we can tell what you're all doing. Um, and to a level that is way beyond what you can tell yourself is doing. So, you know, we're sort of thinking, uh, we were in the car and we had a conversation. I was saying, oh, maybe we shouldn't have had that conversation. And I couldn't remember what, what we'd actually said in the conversation. Maybe that was inappropriate. And I can't even remember what it was. It takes ages to remember it. If we'd actually, you know, data will store everything forever, right? And uh, it will know you better than you know yourself because... You know, if you start liking stuff on Facebook, there's already papers that show that from your Facebook likes, um, you can have computer models that predict your behavior better than your friends can predict it. And that will go further. You will get computer models that predict your behavior better than you predict it. Because you and yourselves have been shown to be two people. You've got the pe person you think you are and the person you actually are. Um, and what the actuality of yourself is much larger than the person you think of yourself. But computers will see the whole you. Right, things like, this was an example, a really interesting example from last year's uh, data science thing. So it was a project in Kenya for monitoring social media for hate speech into tribal stress. You know, so are, is there going to be an issue with are people using hate speech to incite violence in a particular region? You know, it relates, it's not what they're doing with the radio project here, but it could also be done on radio. If we think of the genocide in Rwanda, in my understanding, mostly generated by radio. You could monitor it for that sort of hate speech. You can detect when it's about to happen. No, you need the resources there. You can intervene. Fantastic. But when does that become political dissent monitoring? So hate speech is one thing. Political dissent, complaining about the politics in your region is another. So these are two sides of the same coin. Um, and, and managing this type of thing is extremely difficult. Um, marketing. So this is sort of seems at a different level, but in some sense, it's so widespread. It's affecting us all the time. It's sort of like a background noise that's not even there. I think that the marketing of telling you to buy things becomes super sinister when the target of the marketing is really well understood. And the digital of the environment of the target is also well controlled. So if you're getting a lot of information through your phone and you're really, really well understood, then your phone can affect your behavior. So this is, I call this system zero. I wrote a blog post about it. That actually, you sort of, through your phone, you're interfacing with things. Or later on, maybe it won't be your phone, maybe it'll be something else in 20 years' time. But even now, through your phone, you're interfacing with systems that stored an enormous amount of data about you and modifying their interfaces based on that data. Um, and are trying to, in the end, they want to sell you stuff. Not because of a grand conspiracy, but that's because how you make money. So that's how the effect is. Um, and that's, that's, sort of, that's constant. I mean, very few of us actually spend any time doing anything useful across society. Most of the time, we're just consuming, buying things, doing this. We have this self-image. And you know, that can all be manipulated, which is, I think that's very worrying. Um, and then I sort of get philosophical, philosophical now. What does it mean for your free will if a computer can predict your individual behavior better than you yourself can? And this, I think this is easily on the cards. This is far more uh, likely within the very near term than any type of AI. You don't need AI to do this. You just need a lot of data and that data to be stored and some reasonable modeling. So because we have this weird mismatched self-image because our conscious selves is separate from our subconscious, this sort of thing can happen. Um, so there's a lot of stuff about privacy, so we work on that um, to try and protect your individual. So how do we control this in real life? I don't share everything with you. I don't tell you what I tell my doctor. I don't tell you what diseases I've had and everything else. We retain control over the information we share with individuals because that gives us the correct level of communication. Um, and that's quite right. It's nothing to do with, it's not like, oh, everyone should be open. Well, if you're honest, you should be open. No, because you have different roles. You have a role towards your children, which is to guide them to sort of be a better person than you ideally, right? You've got a role towards uh, your students or your postdocs, which is a different role than your role to your wife uh, or your husband, your partner, your father, your mother. These are all super important, but your digital self is the same. It's the same for everything. Right? So somehow, you project into digital land, you just become an entity, which is all of you. And I think that's very dangerous. 
This also leads to the potential for very large discrimination. So explicit and implicit discrimination on the basis of race, religion, sexuality, health status. These are all prohibited under European law. Um, but they can pass unawares or be implicit. When we were talking uh, so with Mustafa about various ways in which this can happen, one of the ways in which this can happen is like most machine learning is being done in the Western world. So most of it involves white people. So the face detectors for black people are very poor. And no one's even checking that. They're just shipping these things out. I mean, you've already sort of seen this Google face detector, which was taking, uh, took a black person and classified them as a gorilla. I mean, that's totally unacceptable. It's totally unacceptable, but it's passing unawares. It's not explicit. It's because of the systems that are leading up to that. So you actually have to actively work against it. It's not people trying to be mean. It's just the way, it's because there's not enough Africans engaged in building these systems. And actually, that will lead to further inequalities because you'll have systems tailored to the, to the people that don't even need it. I mean, do they really need all this stuff in California? No, they don't need it. It's not even interesting applications. They can make sure that they book a table at their favorite restaurant, you know, because everyone wants to go there. That's the sort of thing they're building apps for. They don't really need that. Um, uh, and of course, we shouldn't deny it to them. Everyone should be happy and try and strive forward. But we have to fight for make sure that you don't, by achieving that, you don't widen inequalities. That's really, really important. That's important for them as well, actually, because we know inequalities, they lead to immigration, they lead to many, many problems. We need to resolve them. So credit scoring, insurance, medical treatment, you can get pushed out of all these things if these systems are biased. If these systems are, um, you know, it's people who are not in the data society because they're not being measured correctly. They suddenly, uh, not, they're disenfranchised already and they become further disenfranchised because they can't access this M. Swafari, was it called? The, uh, you know, the... And Shwari, you know, because they aren't part of the existing population, they become more disenfranchised. Um, we do not want to be in a situation where Silicon Valley develops everything for us. So how do we ameliorate this? Well, we work to ensure the individual cont retains control of their own data. We accept privacy in our real lives. It's actually part of the European Convention on Human Rights. It's a fundamental right. We need to accept it in our digital lives. Um, we, we better control our persona and our ability to project. And we need to increase the awareness of these pitfalls among researchers. The worst bit is that most researchers are so interested in solving their technical problem that they're not even aware of these pitfalls, right? That they have to look out for this stuff. It's, you know, I don't think evil is a dominant thing in the world. It's just carelessness, right? So the way you counteract that is you, you help make people aware. Um, so we need to ensure that technological solutions are being delivered, not merely for the few. There's this really annoying hashtag which people put on Twitter, first world problems, where they put some inane problem that they've got and then they hashtag it first world problems. Actually, quite a lot of them are sort of problems you would have in any world. Um, they're irritating for people. They're just things that are irritating, not real first world problems. They're problems that are irritating for people. Um, and, and I think that that, ch that problem is there's a big problem in perception of where the issues are and how we need to change them. I feel that. I mean, I'm not an expert, but even I sort of feel that. Um, so we need to address a much wider set of challenges because the greater part of the world's population is, is facing those challenges. What we're doing at the moment is we're, not we, not we in, our, in this room, but we as people who are producing data science solutions are producing solutions for a minority, for those who already have everything, and that will just increase inequality. I mean, the great thing is, the really great thing, so I sort of painted a darker picture there, but let's, let's talk about the bright picture. Data science offers a massive amount of promise because it is the modern infrastructure, the information infrastructure. And the ability to distribute things, information, software, is amazing. You no longer have to build massive roads, big dams, all these large sort of infrastructure that was the way you develop in the past, which involves large loans, large amounts of corruption. It all can be done on a small scale. So there's a massive amount of promise but there's all these challenges and pitfalls, and it's really incumbent on us to work to avoid them. I mean, this, this grouping in particular, it's incumbent on interacting with the international community, making people aware of these problem sets. They'd love these problem sets. It's not the people who are against this stuff. They love this data, these challenges. They want to do this stuff, but they have to know that the stuff exists in the first place. So that's it. And uh, you could, I have blog posts a little bit about this, and I tweet sometimes, and uh, more stuff there. Thanks. I probably overran. Sorry. <laughs>
I think if it's done right, I think any time there's uncertainty in the future, it's quite easy. There's a utopian outcome and there's a dystopian outcome. Now, under the utopian outcome, you find all sorts of ways of building economies that allow people to move information around and don't rely on physical infrastructure so much. There are drones delivering drugs to isolated communities. You don't have to build the roads Shira talked about because, and you know, you have this wonderful, uh, diverse flora and fauna and everyone's living a happy life. That's probably not that likely to happen. Under the dystopian outcome, um, everything is driven by data that uh, people accumulate. That data accumulates with large companies and organizations and they use it to make profit um, and you have no say in how they're doing that. So you're kind of exploited uh, a bit like in the film The Matrix. You know. <laughs> the truth will be somewhere in between, obviously. And we want to shift that truth towards the thing where we remove those inequalities. Inequalities will always exist, I believe, but they don't have to exist at the extent that they're existing now. I think that the main thing, I don't know because I don't know necessarily how data science will evolve, but the most important thing is education and understanding and uh, interest, in, um, interest in these technologies so that uh, uh, these, these challenges aren't left behind. What will lead to the dystopian thing is if the challenges which are about addressing the inequalities are left behind by the technology. So what we have to do is make sure that they're carried along with the technology. Yeah. So in economics, they call it a trickle-down effect, right? I mean, it must happen to some extent, probably much less than people say it happens. Like, you know, billionaires don't just leave money as they walk around, trickling around. But you want to have a system that allows that to happen freely and shares things around. Um, it's, you know, it's hard to force it, I think. I think you should be working to build systems that do it. So I think it's evolving. So we were talking with Eric about this last night. He's interested in data science education. Um, and I think that one would not want to write down now the final curriculum for how you teach data science. Because we're in this very dynamic environment where things are changing quite quickly, which, is which may be what causes those, measures, those paradoxes I talked about. Maybe they'll settle out. Um, and uh, if we formalize too quickly, how we do data science, then we'll miss a trick. I think they did that with software engineering. They formalized too quickly, and then they actually had to change quite a lot how they formalized software engineering. So my part, part of my answer is I don't know, um, but then there are some things that are clearly important. So knowledge of classical statistics. I think visualization is super important, actually. You know, the more I think about it, visualization is super important. Uh, and getting these knowledge programming, obviously, is a prerequisite. Uh, but it's hard to tell. But I think we should be thinking, we should be actively thinking about what's needed while realizing we don't necessarily know the right answer. Yeah, so I, I don't know. So we, what would be your advice to the you know, research students? Throw yourself into the data. Um, for a research student, you know, find people, find this community, be here today, um, and find people who know and help who have data problems. Spend time reading things on the internet that help you out. But really make sure you have a data set that you work with and start trying to understand the real problems. Don't just listen to people mouthing off about what they think it is. And, and then you get a sense of data. Because that's the bit that can't be educated at the moment. This is the bit that I think your question's really about. What is the process for analyzing a data set? And um, I, th I have opinions myself about how to do it. But you know, they may not be shared by others. And, and, and the best way to do it is to, do it, is to get there and try. You know. So uh, a question, very interesting comments about the representativeness of the data, the difficulty of measuring in society. It's super difficult here. I mean, if anything, more difficult than yeah. the UK, inequality of social media usage, phone ownership, and access to radio, and everything. Uh, just 
wondered your thoughts there about uh, you know, what we should do in terms of modeling the, the known unknowns. You know, for example, when you pull pulling disasters, you mentioned, I mean, you, you never really see error bars. For example. Yeah. You know, could, could there be, uh, you know, maybe we should think more about uh, knowing what we don't know. Uh, perhaps this comes back to your comment about classical stats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe, I don't know, I get a sense, but I'm not sure if this is a futile sense. In the ideal world, I wish people would understand uncertainty better. Uh, but it's like, you know, in the ideal world, they would understand maths better and they would be more considerate of my needs. Um, <laughs> you know, what, which of those things are practical? So that maybe is about how you represent uncertainty. I think it comes a bit back to that diagram where you've got the interface between the human and the computer. And now you control how things are being presented to the human. And I sort of presented the dystopia like you get marketed things you don't want. But actually, if you regulate that properly, then the information in the data is being correctly presented according to your modeling. But it's, it's a hard thing, isn't it? Yeah, the known unknowns. Um, yeah, more classical stats, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Um, there's a bit of time down, guys. <laughs> who thinks they have a question? Oh, who knows? Let, let's just count by, <laughs> the, uh, by the, hand. Uh, <laughs> there's been a very keen question one, two, at the three, back. Okay. You have to have a horn. Okay. <laughs> really, a really interesting talk. I mean, it resonated really well with me as an anthropologist interested in social science approaches to data science. And I, I found it interesting that you went back to classical statistics and you looked at the training of classical statisticians. So you had a sort of liberal arts training, too. Mm. I think it's very important. Again, I don't know the right way of formally educating it, but social sciences, bridging the gap between social science, computer science, and statistics is the way forward. And that is a big gap on both sides. People in social science don't necessarily understand the way these algorithms are working, and people in um, computer sciences don't really understand the, the, the issues you just mentioned. Vital. I, I had a thought while you were speaking. You know, In the early days of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, um, they uh, the people who built the steam engines did not have a formal education. They just got on with it, you know, in terms of trying to achieve a practical outcome. So I think the reason I love this community is there's an enormous amount of that. If you isolate yourself in silos saying, I just have to build this model and someone else is worrying about that, then those problems come up in spades. But if you're actually trying to give, as Ernest does, the mobile phone to the person that takes the photo in the field, you get a really deep understanding of this pipeline. Uh, which is one of the things that really excites me about the research here. Yeah, really important. So, like, I think that was a very interesting presentation, but uh, you were talking about like, the DRM. I don't know if that would capture the higher level of intelligence, because much as data science is like uh, disruptive at the moment, it's like the big thing everybody's talking about, there's an aspect of happiness, because like, uh, several times people make predictions and they don't come to and this like has a great impact on let me say the final <coughs> because I think if you make a prediction or you say something you think to come to pass it's all like from that science or you use data to like predict something that doesn't come to happen. Yeah. As in the public like gets demoralized as it keeps going down. So yeah. I don't know as in like if maybe in your talk of the future of that science you talk about the accuracy as in the impact of accuracy on people's on people, as in like the impact of well, there's two aspects. So there's one what I'm predicting may happen in the future. So I hope I've been kind of diffuse and just tried to mention the range of strains that something's going to be different and we want to control that. Then there's two, like what happens when individuals have inaccurate predictions made about them. And I think, yeah, that's key. Um, and, but the point I was really making is I want that to be done uh, equally to everyone. I think the thing I'm more worried about is you get inequalities if certain sets of society have more inaccurate predictions made about them than other sets of society. 
And that's where we're headed at the moment, totally. So inaccuracies are important, but uh, you know, they'll always happen. People will always be wrong. Um, it would be cool if people understood that better. Um, maybe they will. Yeah, 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 there could be a backlash. There'll be backlashes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course, that's the way of it, isn't it? Something's hyped, and then, yeah, you know. Yeah. Two last comments. Anna said that. Oh. Yeah, I just think I did a problem with the, the early, so the early, the late 90s, when the, you know, the dot com era, the internet was just kind of gone. And all these fears, kind of the things you talked about privacy and marginalization, and it just kind of worked out. Yeah, but it didn't, did it? Because the irony about the early 1990s is that wasn't when there were fears about privacy. The vision of the internet in the 1990s was it was going to be some sort of libertarian society where anyone that could do whatever they wanted um, and it wasn't under the control of any central authority. And what we have is the opposite of that. Now, we're okay with that. You're right. So people's perceptions, we're somehow okay with that. People's perceptions, the idea of a free internet is kind of gone with all our interaction with Facebook. Um, so in some sense it's, it's people's perceptions shift about what they're comfortable with but you know the one thing I'm not super comfortable with is people losing individual freedom because it was really really hard to get in the first place you know it's one of the things that hasn't come up much in the history of people's individual freedom their control over themselves and if you lose virtual control over yourself that to me is, is close to losing physical control over yourself so, I don't know. Uh, last one from Sherry. Yeah, I just wanted to maybe piggyback on what she said about social sciences and how I'm wondering whether, you know, if uh, you can envision a situation where social metrics and, you know, sometimes you optimize for, you know, profitability. For example, in credit scoring, the idea is to leave out people who won't pay back. But what about if uh, the idea was to, to give people who would actually do useful stuff for the I thought about this type of thing quite a lot because it's back to this credit allocation problem and the more you think about it the more you realize how impossible it is that money is just an inefficient credit allocation situation that we've accepted um, and it's a known problem in machine learning if you've got an intelligent algorithm that's supposed to achieve a certain goal and indulges in a set of complex actions to get there, knowing which of those actions should be rewarded for that end goal is sort of somewhat intractable. It requires a lot of assumptions. So I think that's really, really hard. Um, yeah. <laughs> hey guys, please a round of applause. For Thank you.